Man, I am so excited today to uh, have you here with me, man. Share this story, Leslie Green. Um, man, we've been we've known each other for a long time. We've met right here at PS Styles, the I'm barbershop, yeah, the, infamous. Uh, the infamous barbershop. <laughs> um, and I am humbled and honored that you take the time to hang out with me today. We have so much to talk about. You know, I want to learn about your art of resilience and um, the things that you have been able to manifest in our in our world and um, really talk about how much people you've been able to to touch and help and, and help sort of see things on a different level because I know you did that for me in so many ways in my art and uh, I'm excited man the, you know the thing with the show is to really help people who are you know trying to open up their their ways of progression you know wh- whether they're writing a book whether they're starting a business, whether they're progressing their business, we're just trying to see things on a different level. And people like you have always helped me recognize something about myself that's already there and you're just like pointing me to it. And that's what I really have recognized about our conversations. Mm -hmm. And you've always been so good at sort of plucking those things out and showing them to me. And then I go on and manifest the next thing or whatever, you know? So what I'm hoping today is, man, really just... One, I want to hear your story because it's a very powerful one. Two, I know you'll have some great words of wisdom and gems for our amazing audience. And and three, man, just connect some dots, you know, talk about talk about your recent travels and all those good things. And then, of course, lastly, but not least, talk about family and and um, how you've been able to to grow that and, and be a father and all those beautiful things that I look up to you now for, Absolutely, you know? Man. So hey, I, I thank you for having, thank you for coming, man. I yeah, appreciate man. you. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it, man. This is uh, something I've been wanting to do uh, since you asked me. And I think, um, like you said, man, connecting right here at the barbershop, I can tell you just got your fresh crispy today. It's oh just... man, cleaned them up, you know, <laughs> we had to clean them up, man. <laughs> but yeah, man, you know, like certain people come into your life, man, and they just, you know, show you an energy or something that you connect with them on. And they just, you know, it, it connects you guys. And I think it didn't really like um, click into my mind until you started talking about your book and the title. And when that word resilience came, I was like, that's it. That's the thing that I think, you know, is a, is a common thread between us and yeah. like always like had me with my eye kind of like trying to pay attention to what you were doing and make sure that like I ask, you know, PS or like get your number or like connect because I think that's the thing that I always felt like that was um, a connection between us. So like you even helped me understand what that is. You know, I've been through a lot of things. I got a lot of great stories, but like that word resilience is a really powerful one. I think it kind of is one that really resonates with me and kind of starts to like really encapsulate kind of like a lot of things that um, that I value and like um, what I rely on. You know what I mean to 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 get to where I'm at or you know be who I am. I love that man, and I'm gra- I'm so grateful that it resonates with you because yeah. I I knew it would connect to people that I know are about seeing life in a different perspective not seeing for what it is but for, for seeing for what it could be and i think that that's where the line is a weird sort of foggy area that creates fear self-doubt uh you know all these things that emo- it gets emotional mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. It is, um yeah. and but that's where i feel like i like living like right in that foggy area yeah. where it's you know it's challenging me it's pushing me and i know you're there too mm-hmm Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's go backwards a little bit. Let's start from like, you know, whether whether we're starting college, if you want to start in college, you know, what drove you to be this creative, um, the person that kind of helps, you know, you know, you do crazy amount of marketing. And, and, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your Nike career. I want to talk about, you know, what got you there? What were the sparks that started flying yeah. You know, and when did they start? You know, was it your grandparent that passed it on? Was it your mama? Like, wh- who was it? Yeah, man. So I will I, I guess I have to kind of start at the very beginning, right? So yeah. um, I was born in L.A. Yeah. In L.A. Uh, many, many moons ago. Um, and, you know, growing up as a kid in the 80s in L.A., you know, I think many people have a romanticized view of L.A. now, right? Sure. But, like, shit, growing up in L.A. in the 80s? It was nothing romantic about it, right? Like, I lived in South Central, moved wow. all over the place, like, and, you know, from from my very first five years, I had to, like, start to understand what it meant to be resilient, right? Like, um, my mom's a drug addict. She, wow. she passed away earlier this year. She's been a drug addict her whole life. Wow. And um, 
having that as something that like immediately as like a kid, like you have to deal with that. Um, my dad for half of my life uh, up until 2007 was in prison. Wow. Right. So like immediately starting from scratch, like as a kid, I'm like, I don't even understand this. Yeah, it was going to work out for you. Yeah, exactly. So um, I was really raised by my grandmother and my great grandmother. So my, my grandmother, who I called Mama Sis, who was basically my mom, yeah. um, basically raised me. So she took me, realizing that this situation is probably not good for you. And the, the crazy thing about that was, like, you know, she took me in as her own. And she was a young grandmother, right? Like, you know, I think she probably was in her 30s, you know, wow. when, when she took me over. And, like, imagine being in your 30s. Like, shit, you're probably in your 30s now, yeah. right? Living your being, life. Being a grandparent? Or, or no, being a parent. Yeah, being a parent. Take, just taking in your general. taking yeah. your grandkid and becoming a parent. So um, I always like just thought about that as an amazing feat. And then my great grandmother. So they were really close, and so they kind of raised me. And so um, as I started moving through those early like you know primary school years, I started even at that age to realize how lucky I was. Wow. Right, like it was already conscious. Like okay, so mom's is not in the picture because she, she you know she has an addiction dad's you know whatever he did you know like he's he's unavailable and i have these two women that are you know completely taking care of me and i almost feel like it's probably a better situation than if i had a regular mom and dad like wow. just because they went so hard right. right they went above and beyond to like teach me everything i needed to know uh you know um just again the relationship with women right like being raised by two old school women like it was it was interesting. So I just say like at the at a very young age, I started to appreciate the idea of, um, you know, somebody giving you something that you did that that maybe you wouldn't thought you would have had. You know what I mean? So um, that was uh, that was really powerful for me as even a young age. Um, and the other thing it started to, to help me realize is that I was able to like break through and achieve things, even if I felt bad or was sad or felt like you know self-conscious about things but I was able to like get over that and that's what I think my grandmother and my grandmother always raised me they're like look yeah your mom's not in the picture yeah your dad's not in the picture but look what you have mm -hmm. right and so um from from a very early age I started to appreciate that that's amazing man yeah tell me tell me a little bit about them like what did they do would they work what how, how did they provide for you oh man my grandmother was like the ultimate hustler dude she was such a hustler so she did <laughs> You know, she um, she was in the medical field, sure, but she didn't have any degrees or certifications or yeah. anything, man. She, she was just in like it. she would go into a dentist office and be herself and beam that light, and they would put some scrubs on her and say, "We want you to work in our office." Wow! So she worked in like dentist offices. She worked for a podiatrist, yeah. like working on feet, right. and then she learned how to kind of do it herself. Wow. Again, she's not a medical professional, sure, sure. And then she would go, and people would hire her to come you know work on their their feet like yeah. house calls wow like like people in hollywood like yeah michael jackson's agent and like wow. this like julio iglesias like yeah, yeah, like yeah. like weird hollywood <laughs> like you know stars would like have her come work on her feet work on their feet wow and she used to do that and she would come tell me the stories and so she always kept her kit in the trunk and the reason she did that is because she literally made a sacrifice to take care of me full time. Sure. So she wanted to drop me off at school. She wanted to pick me up. She wanted to drop me off at activities. And so she knew if she had a nine to five gig, she wouldn't be able to do that. Right. So she wanted the ultimate flexibility. So if she needed to work, she wanted to just say, I'm going to come to your feet. And yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. yeah, even her career path and what she chose was centered around making sure that I had the best opportunity. And so like, for me, that like at a very early age was like, okay, that's the idea of parenting. It's like, Wow. sacrifice and like yes. what you'll do to provide and make sure that your 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 kids are you know taken care of so uh wow. yeah man it was it was powerful powerful stuff is she still around no she passed yeah she passed in uh 2007 yeah yeah well i'm sorry to hear that man uh may allah bless her soul she sounds like a remarkable human being who raised another amazing human being and she was man she was um, she you know was. what would we do without those sacrifices what would we do you know that's why i think you and i even connect on deeper levels because i saw things like that from my brothers my sister do my sister you know growing up like i was not a good student like i, I was very artistic but when it came to like science, mathematics, all that, it was like, I don't, why are there numbers? Why do these things even exist? You know, I was that kid. But like, 
you know, again, like you said, like the sacrifice that people, my father, dude, my mom, you know, everybody, right? Like I was, I was so lucky, man, to have had a mom and dad and all my siblings, though we were in a refugee camp, you know, which we'll talk about later. I still had structure around me and, and, and people like my brothers used to walk like five miles just to go get some water, you know, like, dude, you know, but it's, for me, it's the same story, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's who is in your life that's making that sacrifice like you're working on feet like that's not the sexiest thing in the world like you know what i'm saying you ask anybody like i'm trying to do that but she'll and go if somebody's asking you to work on their feet yeah their feet are trash <laughs> <laughs> like, like if they're asking like i need that help yes yeah, like it's not a good you know but but like putting that pride aside putting yeah. your you know because you have something so much more important that you are taking care of yeah and uh that's so beautiful to hear, man. I'm yeah, glad man. you shared that with me because that's that that resonates with me even deeper. Yeah. So, all right, you get through high school. You f- you're feeling really lucky. Um, what was what was that like? You know, and then well, getting into college. Like, what was that like? Yeah. Well, it was it was so. Um, you know, as I said, my grandmother and, and, and great grandmother raised me. Um, my dad got out of prison for the first time, and so me just as a boy, like I wanted to spend time with my dad. Like we had a good relationship, even though he was away. Sure. So he gets out of jail like junior high school. Wow. And I go live with them. Yeah. My grandmother's like, hey, like, if you want to live, spend your time with your dad, like, yeah. I want you to be with your dad. So I moved my dad to Beverly Hills. So you can imagine a kid, like, that grew up in South Central L.A., in the hood, with all the good and the bad that comes with that. Now I'm plucked and I'm in Beverly Hills. Literally went to, like, El Rodeo Junior High School. Right? Like, <laughs> with, That's like, crazy. you know. You were like the Fresh Prince. I love it. It was like that. And it was yeah. funny because it was a lesson for me. Um, I remember the first day of school, like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, yo, so all these kids are rich. I got to impress them, right? Because I'm feeling less than. So, <laughs> Dude, wow, um, wow. I had my dad take me to the mall. I got the Jordan flight sweatsuit with the elephant print on the <laughs> bottom and on the jacket. Went to the barber shop. Got hooked got up. Got the jump man carved into the wow, back of my head. Like, fly. I was matching literally head to toe. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I get to school the first day. I'm feeling, you know, 100. luxurious. <laughs> and so I get to school the first day, and I'm like, literally all these kids have ripped jeans, dirty sneakers. Like, they, they don't give a about any of that. Like, like, when people have real, real money. They don't care. So I got there, and I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> I was like that. So I had to, like, go back and tell my dad, like, no, I got to change my- <laughs> I just need like some dockers. And, Let's like, go to Goodwill. Yeah. Get some, so, get some gear. And it was a lesson. It was like, man, like don't ever try to like overcompensate to fit in wow. or think that you're going to, you know, impress people. It's like literally just be yourself. Wow. And so uh, that was a good lesson. So I went to junior high school in Beverly Hills. Um, my, uh, my dad ended up going back to jail. So I moved with my uncle. And so my uncle uh, had married a doctor at the time or was like engaged. And so we moved to New Jersey for a year. Oh, wow. Um, we moved back to California. I went to school in the valley in a, in a, in a city called Redlands. And I was living with my uncle, uh, his, his wife, and my, my cousin, who's, like, basically my brother. And, um, you know, I'm starting to, like, become a man, you know what I mean? Start to, like, spread my wings, be independent, figure out what I want to do, um, talk to girls and go sure. play basketball, all those things, right? And so um, I, I, you know, was able to, like, do some odd jobs and got a phone. So not a phone. A pager. Pager. I got a yeah. pager. Yeah. Because yeah. um, now you're like in the mid 90s. Like, yeah, like early 90s. 90s early oh, early like 90s. 91, 92. Okay. Maybe yeah. even 93. Okay. So, um, pagers. So I got a pager, and my uncle was like, man, you can't have a pager. That means you're a drug dealer. I'm like, I'm not a drug dealer. I got a pager. We got in a huge fight about it. Wow. He literally kicked me out the house. Wow. Yeah. Over a pager. Like, this is like, this is like January, I think, of 1994. Oh my God! So it's cold. you're in the refugee camp right around right this time, now, right? Yep. yep. So um, and I have six months left to graduate high school, and he kicked me out. Oh my God! Um, and so I went to move with my best friend at the time, literally living on my own, going to school every day until I can finish, um, and and still keeping track. And again, it's like in my mind, I'm thinking like, because I already had my plan to like go to college. I'm like, sure. my uncle's gonna take care of it. I'm watching Different World. I'm watching Cosby show. I'm like, I'm yeah. just going to go to college and be a successful black person. Like, I saw that on TV. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And then when I got kicked out, that kind of rocked my world. It's like, oh, what am I going to do now? Mm. So I finished, graduated, still with good grades, but I had no money, right? And my mom and my, I'm sorry, my grandmother and my great-grandmother, they don't have any money. So sure. um, my plan was to go to the Navy. 
Oh, wow. So okay. my best friend who I was living at the time, we're like, yo, we're going to go to the Navy together. They had this thing called, like, uh, buddy enlisting. Wow. And so we literally went to the recruitment office, like, we're going to take you down to San Diego. We're going to sign you up. You're going to get, <laughs> you know, your physical. And we're like, yeah, this is it. Let's like, go. this is the only way. We, this is all we got. Yeah. So we're driving down from, from, Cali- from, uh, from like, the L.A., like, uh, Valley area to San Diego. This is literally the same day that O.J., was driving down the highway in the back of the Bronco truck because we're like watching it on the news wow. when we get to the hotel. And so uh, it's also during the NBA finals, like yeah. in the Rockets one. So we're watching that. And so we go to the, the next day, we wake up, we go to the recruitment center. We start all the process, physicals, training. And literally at lunchtime, because we had to go separately, my boy's like, yo, um, they did my physical and I'm legally blind in my left eye, so I can't join the Navy. Oh. <laughs> no, like, don't what? do me like that. I'm like, what? <laughs> And then, but I don't have no choice. I'm like, ah, I got to go through the process. Yeah. So I'm going through the process. I'm getting tested, blood work, uh, all this stuff. So then I'm on a break. Like it's like 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I call my mom on a payphone. I'm like, yeah, you know, my boy's yeah. not going to be able to go. He's blind, yeah. but I'm still you're going to do this. He's like, oh, yeah. Um, your grandfather calls. So my grandfather on my dad's side. Sure. He's like, he'll say he'll, he'll pay for your first year of school. I was like, what? Wow. I was like, I'm at the Navy right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm about to sign up. She's like, well, see what you can do. It's wow. Like, all right, so I'll go back in. I'm like, um... I'm not going. Hey, guys, uh, <laughs> funny story. <laughs> I can't join the Navy. They're like, dude, it's too late. You're in here. Yeah. And I'm like, um... I'm like, but I didn't swear in yet. Yeah. And you could just see their face. They're like, damn. Yeah. You got us. Yeah. So this recruiter had to drive us all the way back. Wow. One blind dude, one dude who's not going. <laughs> He's um, mad. And then, man, I was, I was able to go to college, man. And like wow. I said, I was watching Different World... And I was, you know, inspired by all that stuff that was happening, mid-90s, sure. hip-hop, the HBCU sweatshirts. And I was like, man, I'm going to go to HBCU. So yeah. I went to Clark Atlanta University. Okay. So, man, as you were, I think you came to America in June. June 1994. 1994. Mm-hmm. So I'm, like, graduating high school, preparing to go to college at the same time. That's crazy, man. And, uh, yeah, man, I stepped foot in Atlanta, and it was, like, a whole new world. Like, all the things that I didn't love about L.A., in the 80s was like totally different from Atlanta in the 90s it was like black people everywhere successful from top to bottom you had like black people working at McDonald's and CEOs of companies Mm. like middle class upper class it's just like I'd never seen that before right and so um, it was something that like made me feel totally at home and and gave me like a great place to explore who I am and and decide who I want to be so uh, I loved Atlanta Um, spent 10 years there Wow. Um, graduated from Georgia State um, after I transferred um, and stayed on to kind of um, well, let me take a step back. So my last year of Georgia State, um, I wanted to get a jump start and, and I decided kind of my junior year I wanted to work in marketing. I was like, I want to work in business. Okay. Yeah. This is probably the only discipline that feels creative when I look at the classes. I was like, let me try that. Mm-hmm. Took a couple classes. I was like, yeah, this is for me. I love marketing. I always watch commercials as a kid. Sure. Um, I used to love that show Bewitched because oh yeah, the guy Bewitched da- was the business. Yeah, the guy Darren Stevens was always coming up with campaigns. Yeah, and I was a kid. I was like, I can do that. And yeah. so I loved it. And so um, that's cool, man. Yeah. So my senior year, I was like, I'm gonna get a jump start. So I got a job in marketing. The only job I could get was working for Georgia Power, the power company. Okay. Which is like that's the worst marketing job. Where you, you, you gonna market? Yeah, you got that power, right? <laughs> like, where you gonna market? <laughs> so. Finally, I weaved my way into a department that was doing like economic development. They were like trying to convince companies to come move their businesses to Georgia so they could get a m- bunch of money for power. Like, oh, okay. Mercedes, move your plant here. So, oh, uh, I see. So I was literally behind a desk, and I worked during the day. So yeah. I, I changed my classes to go to school at night. So right. I was going to school at night with all the old people. Wow. And I was at work like nine to five. No disrespect to the old people. We love yeah, y'all. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm old now, so I'm talking about myself now. <laughs> Um, and so I was working the day and going to school at night. And so by the time I graduated, I was like, man, I'm to- so tired of sitting behind a desk and wearing these wrinkle free khakis. You know what I mean? So I was like, I didn't want to go straight sure. to a desk job. Yeah. So I started doing uh, like experiential marketing tours. So the companies wow. that like want to do promo tours for like anything from like Tropicana orange juice, sure. Uncle Ben's rice like a toy company like anything we would take vans like this yeah and we would travel across the country and we would do marketing i would set up a van in front of a grocery store have people sample orange juice sure, sure. sample rice wow. um and it was like a part of me was like man this is probably the most unsexy thing i could do but a bigger part of me like loved it of course like literally talking to actual people, people. on the street yeah like consumers yeah um and and getting to see the country right i was always interested in different parts of the world which is 
like why I loved moving to Jersey for a year, moving to Beverly Hills. Like all these things were like sociology studies for me to like understand yeah. different cultures and different people. And I was always like really um, into that. And so this was another way for me to do that. We literally drove across the country, probably half the states in the union. Wow. Um, and That's I would amazing. just stop in these places and set up for a couple weeks, and figure what it out. What an experience, though. It like, was dope. What an experience, man. It was dope. Yeah, I That's loved really it, That's really cool. I loved it. So you were learning this marketing. but it ground w- level. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was going to say, you're learning marketing, but you're doing it in a way that's very experiential with human beings, which is what I believe real marketing is. It's, it's, it's a, not just like, oh, here's my orange juice, here's my thing, but it's like, what does that taste like? You yeah. know, because now you're having a conversation. Yeah, yeah. You get to get that feedback. And I feel like having those conversations, joking, and, oh, you, you went to what school? You went to, you know, that's what I absolutely love about doing refugees. And we do, when, you know, before COVID hit and stuff, like we were doing events and doing things. I love to make it just because I get to meet people. And, and what it does connect. is it yeah. puts an actual face with a brand. And if brands could do that all the time, they would. But it's, it's hard to scale it's that. Difficult. But yeah. when you do it, that person, when they go to that aisle and pick up that orange juice, they're actually thinking about me, yeah. not just the juice, right? Yeah, so, or that convo or the laughter or the joke. Ju- yeah. It's a personal 100%. connection. So um, that was really interesting. That's the flip cool. side is yeah. it, although I was kind of on the like the, the you know, the the ground basement level, yeah. I started to have meetings and interactions with those execs, right? at those companies, the marketing CMO, vice president for Uncle Ben's, for Tropicana. Yeah. And I started to realize, like, oh, for great. the most part, they're all white males. Of course. So I'm in these boardrooms <laughs> or, like, you know, showing up, and I'm like, ah, this is where the decisions are happening. So that started to open my eyes, like, that's mm. actually where I need to be. Mm. This is good for now because I'm learning, but that's the goal. I need to be in those rooms helping to make the decision because right now I'm on the receiving end of those, which is cool. That's where I am. That's where I am my journey, but I want to be – helping to inform those decisions. I love that. And so man. that was kind of like what sparked me on my like road to I think where I am now. I love that. All right. So now so you're, you know, at, like as a person that's trying to move forward towards something, you see it and it's that's you're like, man, I could, it's right there. How do I get there, right? And then we start to tell ourselves stories of like fears and self-doubt and all those kinds of things. You know, honestly, I think when I was younger, I didn't really have it. I was just going, mm-hmm. right? Like I was hitting those walls, not knowing that there was resist. I didn't know the labels, mm-hmm. right? There was mm-hmm. labels there. But I think a part of my, um, I guess you could say ignorance, mm-hmm. w- also propelled me because it was like, you're hitting a wall, but I'm like, this doesn't matter. It's been my life that way. It's all good. I'm going to keep going. Right. But like today, you know, especially as you've gotten older and now that we're in the information age, Like, people have separated themselves from that, like, hustle, right? Mm -hmm. From that grind. Like, look, I see where I want to go, but I have all these fears. I have all these things. Like, how did you, in that time, because I know it's going to come up more, Mm -hmm. in those moments in time, what were you telling yourself to, like, see yourself there? Pitch yourself there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think, honestly, it was was about uh, doing the work and having the knowledge and earning and earning my spot. Because once you earn your spot, then I deserve to be there and I'll do whatever I can. So like, again, on the marketing side, like, yeah, I was passing that samples, but I was also doing market research. I'm talking to consumers. I know exactly what they, what they're, what they know. I'm studying the product line. I'm talking to the managers to figure out what's going wrong. I'm studying the competition, understanding why their price is higher. Uh, I'm going to different stores and seeing how you know, things are on the shelf differently. So I'm doing the work and the knowledge. And so once you do that, it really creates this confidence in you to say, you know what, like when you hear the execs talk and they don't know what you know, it's like, okay, I, I, I can be there. I can do that. Like, so whatever skill that I need to acquire, whatever piece is missing, I go get it and I go understand it. I go study it. I go do the research. So I wanted to make sure that whatever I, whatever room I wanted to be in, that I walk in as an expert. Mm. Or, or somewhat yeah and so um that's what i think gave me the confidence to to break through some of the things that i knew were going to be natural barriers whether it was my age skin color sure you know not having a connection personal you know i just that's how i broke through it i love it so your knowledge base your 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 hustle and grind and all those things were always enveloped with this idea that look if i got the knowledge i can be in that room and i love that because knowledge is power it's the most powerful thing right 
but you put it into action. Yeah. And yeah. that's for me, that's where your true power shines, right? That's how you ignite the thing. Mm-hmm. So, all right, man. So we're it's what late nineties at this point. This where are we like, at? Yeah, like right, kind of early two thousands. Okay, yeah, early two ma- thousands. Maybe, maybe at literally two thousand. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're at two thousand. I'm starting. I'm just getting ready to start high school. Damn. Right. So I'm young, and I just like. I mean, I'm still fresh. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Six years in America, bro. Yeah. <laughs> right. Accent. I'm, I'm sure it was thick. Oh my god. Accent. <laughs> just <laughs> everything. And I, like you said, you know, I was trying to impress i was trying to figure out who i was in different ways right everybody has their own way and uh you know i felt like the fresh prince of beaverton so (laughs) you and i relate to that because i came from the desert refugee camp to beaverton (laughs) you know what i'm saying which is across the street right from nike headquarters bro like beavertron i can't i can't imagine it back then either oh my god man it was like su- it's i mean it's a beautiful suburb right yeah, yeah. it's beautiful i'm like yo is grass what is grass yeah, all these trees and, and water why do you put so much water on this grass <laughs> like <laughs> we don't have water like this like too much water the for the abundance grass. <laughs> the abundance was was so overwhelming for me you right. know and and uh you know it was just a place to start thriving mm-hmm. and 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 appreciating yeah. like i was on another level i knew the, the moment I walked off that plane, I knew my level of appreciation for life was always going to be a little bit higher than some of my peers who had no, who've never been to a refugee camp, right? Who've never seen crazy things happen and yeah. people, you know, war, any of that. So, but, but being there, I always had this, like you said, man, a level of, of appreciation for your fam and, and the environment in which you're growing. Yeah. And so, all right, so we're, we're, I'm at Nike, but something's happening for you. Yeah. You're getting ready to make some major moves. Yeah, I made Let's, some transitions. So as I said, I was doing all these experiential marketing tours for kind of like all of these big companies and starting to like see a little bit of the challenges for someone like me breaking through, but I'm doing the work. So right around 2000, a friend of mine that I knew from Atlanta started his own agency. Mm. And uh, their first client was the Truth Campaign. Okay. So back in the day, that tobacco awareness campaign. Yes, I remember. <laughs> so that was that was their only client. And so he was like, yo, I want you to come on and help me. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So started doing that in 2000. I was an account manager uh, on the agency side. We started doing tours for The Truth. And what was dope that about was Truth big. is yeah. that they took a different approach. Like in my generation, they had this thing called the D.A.R.E. campaign. Yeah. Which I, was like, I remember that. Yeah, just yeah. don't do drugs. Yeah. Like, yeah. that was the. Just don't do it. Yeah. Or something like that. Right? Like, that never works. Like, people will do it just because you said that. So, like, they took a different approach. They're like, hey, we're going to create a youth brand. We're going to talk about sports, music, yes. art. We're going to relate to kids. And we're not even going to tell them not to smoke. We're just going to tell them, hey, here's the information. The tobacco companies target you, they find you, they want to get you addicted. They draw cartoons to get you in as a kid. Right. They right. put the advertisements eye level for five year olds. You can do what you want with the information. And so, that was refreshing, right? Like, wow. so I think that's why it was a really successful campaign. Yeah. Or just a successful co- company, company, yeah. brand, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, initiative. And but it so, also had a, such an amazing cause. Stop absolutely. smoking, Ab- right? Absolutely. Like, it's killing you and it's killing everybody around you. Yeah. And it's like, making some people a bunch of money. Right. Right. So, um, so you know, we started doing all the experiential stuff from that. I started like really getting into um, the idea of being able to market. And, and, and talk about branding and advertisement through things that I loved, art, music, sports. We sponsored the And One Basketball Tour. Uh, I literally oh, went man. on the Vans Warp Tour, which is like the biggest punk rock tour probably wow. in the history so far. And so wow. I'm like, not only am I in marketing, but I'm not slanging rice or juice anymore. <laughs> like I'm literally in my element. Yeah. And so I just felt really comfortable. And now the light bulb's going off. Not only can you work in marketing and advertising, but you can do it in a way that's authentic to who you are and mm. the things that you love. And so that was like a whole nother chamber. Yeah. Right. That because that... now I have more information than the people in the boardroom. Wow. Right? Because I know music, I know sport, I know art. And, and you know people. And I know people, right? So um started killing it on the agency side. Agency can be a little bit tricky, just like finances here and there. So I got laid off. Sure. The actual foundation who sponsors Truth hired me on to go client side. So I ended up literally leaving my agency to go on the client side and manage the agency that I used to work for. Right. Um, so me and the family moved to D.C. And this is right around the time that um, I had my first daughter. Oh, right? wow. So this is 2004, January. My daughter's born. 
Wow. Um, and that was another just like pivotal moment because then it's like you're not just doing this for yourself anymore. It's like you have a whole human being that you have to be responsible for. Yeah. So now all of my decisions have a long-term element to it. And um, so that was just kind of another sure. motivating factor for me to just really take hone in. my path and, 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 and hone in and, and be more precise on what I'm doing. So I love that. moved to D.C., uh, in 2004, started working for the uh, American Legacy Foundation, who's behind the Truth Campaign. And it's funny because I was brought on just to run the experiential side, the events. But the the woman who brought me in, who was kind of the brand lead, she left like right after I started. So then I was doing her job as well. Wow. So now I'm doing experiential. We're still doing TV ads at that time, radio ads, if you can believe that. Yeah. Started our digital program, which was like basically just starting a Facebook and a MySpace. Yeah, yeah, page. yeah. I was gonna say Ma- MySpace. Yeah, definitely, was, yeah. It was definitely a lot but of. But they MySpace. were on top, though. They I were. mean, they, like, I mean, you're cutting, you're cutting edge. You're yeah. still, you're like introducing this world, like you're migrating in quickly Absolutely. because it was just starting. Absolutely. So, I was just graduating high school. Man. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. So I started doing that, and um, yeah, and then again, sitting in the the boardrooms of top advertising agencies giving them instructions, giving them feedback. Wow. And so, and them, like, agreeing with the feedback and yeah. receiving it. And, like, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So then, again, my confidence starts to build. Mm-hmm. I start to get more exposure, understand that world a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, like, that's kind of when I was like, yeah, man, I'm going to hit this full throttle. This is where, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So I knew that I was in the right world of marketing and branding. Um, I didn't really love nonprofit. Sure. Um, so I was like, I want to work for bigger and better brands. I decided to quit my job mm-hmm. and go to grad school full time. Oh, wow. OK. Which was crazy because American Legacy has such good benefits. They would have paid me to go to school at night um, and get my MBA. So I got accepted to Georgetown, sure. George Washington. I could have kept my job nine to five and went to school at night. And that was the plan. But I found this program in Richmond, Virginia at VCU Brand Center. Mm-hmm. Back then it was called Ad Center. Uh, and I just fell in love with the program, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So yeah, had to convince my wife to let me quit my job full time. Wow! Uh, I moved my my wife and my daughter up to Brooklyn with her in law, with my in laws, with her wow. parents, and I was commuting between Brooklyn and Richmond, Virginia, basically like every other weekend. Wow! Flying back and forth to finish grad school for like two years. That's incredible, man. Yeah, because that's another sacrifice. It is I, like, and it's funny because in my mind, I'm like, man, I never make it easy on myself. <laughs> like, nah, but, but it's exactly nah. what I wanted to do. When you see a program and you, and you mm-hmm. know exactly that it's tailor made for you, it was all about collaboration, yeah. creativity, innovation, um, and everybody worked together. Like the art directors, the copywriters, the strategists, the brand leads, like they all worked together as a as a unit. And I saw that as the future of marketing and advertising. So I was like, this is something. Um, this is the kind of program I need to be in. This is going to be what gets me where I need to go. Yeah. Okay. So you graduate, got your master's degree now. Yeah. Well, even before that. So after my first year of yeah. grad school, yeah. um, Nike came to our school to recruit. Oh, okay. And uh, that was a moment for me, right? Because when I decided to go back to grad school, I knew um, I had a hit list of places that I wanted to work. And I knew that going to this specific kind of school and not getting my traditional MBA, I'm probably not going to go to a Kellogg's or Unilever. I'm, I'm going to go to those companies that value innovation and collaboration. And so I, I was looking at Apple and Nike. Nike was obviously at the top of that list. Adidas, places like that, Beats by Dre. Those, that was my goal. And I was going to hold out and like not take a job until I could you know, get to where get I wanted on. to be. Yeah. So Nike came to recruit my, my um, in between my first and second year. And that's the only time they actually came to school to recruit. So it was like super serendipitous that they came. Wow. And I met the recruiter. We vibed. And she just, you know, said, hey, like, I think you'd be perfect at Nike. I know a couple people that just remind me of you and I want to hook you up with them. So I started to develop a relationship. And at first, man, like, I was obsessed. Like, I would email the recruiter every single day. Like, what's up? And then I started to, like, realize, like, man, that's, there's not a lot of value in that. Like, I'm, now I'm just bothering someone. So mm-hmm. I took a different approach. What I started to do is, like, you know, she would connect me with someone, and I would see how I could bring value to them. Mm-hmm. So if I got hooked up on email with a basketball brand director, I wouldn't just call them and say, hey, can I have a job? I would email them and say, hey, I know you're the basketball brand director. I did some research on my own of, like, the best street ball courts across the country in case that's somewhere you would want to seed. 
here's a list of like, you know, top basketball athletes on the streetball level. Um, I did my own research on price points and like talked to the guys at Foot Locker what shoe sellers I would bring value and send them this information. Wow. And then I started to, the responses started to be different, right? Then it's like an engaged reciprocal relationship. And so um, I did that like my whole second year of grad school. So I started developing these really good relationships. Wow. So by the time. Man, this is powerful though. Yeah. This is, if you, whoever's listening right now, <laughs> like you got to listen to this. These are gems. He is dropping gems on you right now because we as young people, man, we don't realize that like when we want, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut your yeah, story please, off yeah, because no. we'll get back to it. Yeah. But I, this is a, I want to make an emphasis on this right here because this is a layer of resilience, right? This, this is a layer that you build based on what not only what you want but what you can provide yeah, yeah. that value right yeah. and so you're like you're doing your own work over here you're researching and you're you're like yo this guy works here he might need this kind of information i'm gonna just do some homework and give it to him unprompted free yeah <laughs> free like i'm gonna do this all this work for free in hopes to create and build a relationship so that it could lead to something yeah. and it may not be this person he may hit me with another contact over here and this may go on for a year yeah, yeah. before somebody goes hey man why don't you come work for me yeah. or whatever yeah, right yeah, yeah yeah so that's so powerful i love the idea of giving value that's what my father did in that refugee camp it's literally the reason i came to america he painted mm -hmm. he painted the king and the prince and all that mm -hmm. because he knew those soldiers were going to come into our tent right he knew it because yeah. it happened before. He's like, they're going to come and they're going to see my paintings yeah. and they're going to buy it. And my mom was like, what the hell are you doing? You trying to get in trouble? You trying to die? No. He was like, nah, this, I this know the what way. they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sure enough, bro, one guy led to another, to another, and here we are, right? But uh, please continue your conversation because it, it is right now, again, please, if you're listening, listen carefully. So, yes, um, getting back to this resilience idea. So, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling good, right? It's like February. I'm about to graduate in May. I've been having these great conversations with Nike folks for almost a year. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeling pretty confident. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to get in. I'm going to be at Nike. So <laughs> gets to the point where I have an interview for a brand direct, a brand manager job in Nike basketball. Amazing. In February, all the rest of the kids at school are scrambling, getting their portfolios together. I'm like, I'm good, man. I, I don't have to do all that. I got this soda. So um, for those that know Nike and they know 2009, which is the year I was graduated, that I was graduating, this was the year of the huge reorg that they have and the layoffs. So I had an interview scheduled um, on a day at my school that m most people are doing their portfolio for companies. I was like, I don't need to do that because I already got my job. So I'm interviewing for it, and the time comes and goes when the interview's supposed to start. I'm like, well, what's going on? So I literally call Nike, the front desk. I'm like, hey, I need to speak to so-and-so because I have an interview. They're like, oh, yeah, um, those guys don't work here anymore. They just got laid off yesterday. And I'm like, nah, nah, because I have a nah. job interview. And they're like, nah, they're you like, understand. They're like, you don't understand. So I'm like, <laughs> oh what? my god. So I'm going into, like, I'm in shock, man. I'm like, wow. My plan is now like all shattered. Yeah. So I'm trying to scramble and figure out what I'm gonna do. Wow. Now I have to like actually apply for jobs. Yeah. Uh, and we, put a portfolio together. Put a portfolio together. <laughs> Weeks and months are going by. I think the only job offer I had was like with Muscle Milk. And I was trying to, in my mind, make like, that's, that's, like, that's kind of like Nike a little bit. Like. <laughs> so finally, like uh, a couple of like weeks before I graduate, I got a call and they're like, hey, um, we know you're supposed to interview here. We really, you know, value you. Um, we don't have a job, but we have an internship. Mm. Are you willing to do an internship? At the time, I'm like, again, I'm Anything. in my 30s. I got a wife. I got a kid. And I'm like, you know what? After yeah. it, I'll do it. And so um, I came to Portland. Did my internship for three months, fell in love with Nike, fell in love with the sure. campus. And I was like, yeah, this is where I want to learn the things that I want to learn now. This is where I want to be. This was my, you know, so I'll do the internship. And I did that. At the end of the, the internship, they didn't have a job. Again, still kind of the remnants of the reorg. Went back to Brooklyn to where my wife and daughter were. And was just kind of like doing um, some freelance stuff, some okay. consulting. And finally, in October of that year, I literally got two offers on the same day. One from Wyden Kennedy to work on Nike business as a strat planner and one from Adidas in Portland wow. to be a brand manager for Adidas Originals. And so I went back to grad school to be a ma brand manager. I really didn't want to go agency side. And so on paper, like literally Adidas was on my list. Yeah, sure. So like everything made sense. Like, okay, you go got the thing that you yeah, want. 
So I signed the, the offer letter. I can't remember if I faxed in or emailed at the time, sent it, and I couldn't sleep, man. I could not go to sleep. Mm. I was tossing and turning all night. I woke up the next day. I was like, man, I can't take the Adidas job. So I called them and rescinded my offer. Wow. It was like the worst feeling in the world. I can't even imagine. <laughs> this is somebody's dream job. And you're over here like, nah, I'm good. I don't want to do this. But like, and yes. And I just knew, I just yes. had a feeling that if I took that job, I would never end up at Nike. And I really wanted to have that experience. Wow, man. And so, um, yeah, and they were like, dude, you're never going to work here again. And dude, I was like, I it know. takes, <laughs> it takes an unbelievable amount of courage to do that because you saw yourself at Nike and and to remove that image was so hard. Yeah. I can't even imagine because like, look, I'll be real with you. I saw myself at Nike. Yeah. Here's, I, I saw you there too. <laughs> literally the day I came in for my interview, right? You walked me to my interview. That's do right. Do you remember that? That's right. Okay. Me and hand building, right? Bro, I... Yeah, this this was my like third interview. That's right. And I was like, all right, I gotta hit my man up, and I mean, we'll get to to That's when you right. actually got there and yeah, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And this is my third interview, and like I wanted to work at Nike so bad, and I had my heart just set on it. I was like, this is it. There's no way they're not gonna pick me. It's happening. Are you kidding? Do you remember when I showed you my portfolio? The wood cover with the leather with the things and the straps. Legit. And the, all right, and here is a man who knows what he's talking about marketing, just saying my portfolio was legit. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but um, man, I, and it was the hardest like couple of months of my life because not only did I want a job at Nike, I wanted to. I don't. I, w- I don't know if it was even like prove something it's to validation. anybody. Yeah, it's validation. it was like yo, I wanted to run with the big dogs. Like I want. I want to be cr- a creator here, you know? And, and deserve to be. And deserve to be, right? Yeah, and that's yeah, how I felt. Yeah, yeah. And and I get it, man. That market is so competitive, right? Like, it's, you are, it's competitive, period. Yeah. But it was also a blessing in disguise that I didn't get the job, right? There's there's something else brewing for me. And, uh, but, man, let's get back to your story. So you... <laughs> I, I, I literally turned this down the so job that I went back to school for. This and is the I, hardest thing in the world. And yeah. I took the I took the 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 widen job just because I would be working on Nike business. Yes. And I was like, you know what? I'll go do this for a couple years. They'll see the work I'm doing on the agency side, and I'll get to Nike eventually. That was my plan. Mm-hmm. So we picked up, left Brooklyn, moved to Portland, literally January first, mm-hmm. two thousand ten, to start the decade off. Um, started working at Widen, and like you know, three four months go by. I'm hopping in the zip cars down on 13th Street, driving out to Beaverton two, three times a week, yeah. doing presentations, presenting campaign strategies. So and now you're in there, like you're in, yeah. you're on campus. Yeah. And people are looking at me like they think I work there because I was there all summer. It's yeah. so like, oh, so what, what department are you working? I was like, no, I'm at White. And they're like, what? Yeah. So they're confused. Yeah. So I'm pr- now I'm in the meetings with the people that I'm working with. They're like, yeah. wait a minute, you don't work here? Yeah. Why not? And so literally <laughs> this thing that I thought was going to take two years I was at Nike in five months. Oh. Like they literally were like, "Yo, you need to come work here." Yeah, and so they called Widen and worked it out because I still like had moving contracts. Contract. <laughs> it was a little messy. Yeah, but they figured it out, and so uh, I started at Nike May thirteenth, two thousand ten. Incredible. Yeah, and so I landed in, in a in a role called MDP, Marketing Development Program. Yeah, um, and it was like a rotational program where you go to different categories different geographies and you basically do different jobs for like three to six months at a time to get a wide breadth of experience so you're at nike you just you're basically just starting at nike but you kind of been there yeah yeah yeah, yeah, technically yeah yeah. um so you're official now yeah 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 yeah, the black (laughs) badge the black badge oh my god um so you got your black badge you're doing it this is your dream job more more or less from from my understanding and, and of knowing you um which is spectacular. How did you meet this guy, Patrick? Oh, man. How did you, so what, how did that happen? It's funny. So when I was at Widen for those few months, yeah. obviously like, you know, when you're a black man, you show up to a new city, the first thing you got to <laughs> find is the barbershop, right? Like that's the biggest <laughs> dilemma. I mean, I don't yeah. have any hair now, but I did back then. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. there's a guy I work with named Dez. Yeah. And, uh, you're talking like, about Desmond. Desmond. Marzette. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bro, I just hit him. That's crazy. Exactly. Anyway, so yeah. uh, I was like, where can I get here? He's like, man, you need to go to uh, yes. my man Pat down in Portland State. <laughs> so I come down here, 
And this is like no other barbershop I've ever been to. <laughs> right. Like the hours, no appointments, <laughs> like yeah. the jokes. Cash only. Like <laughs> even even the clientele is like the most diverse, diverse. I've ever seen in any barbershop. Right. Like white, black, Arab, <laughs> you know, Saudi. Like everybody. Latin, Brazilian, like everything. Women. Women, yeah, exactly. Kids. And so um crazy. Like Again, but, but me and Pat started to develop a relationship because we were like like minded, and we you know I think we started to like connect personality wise. If we didn't connect, I would not come to PS. Like, it is a hassle, it but it's the a- most beautiful hassle. You know what I mean? Because it's Pat, and you know what you get with him. It's a genuine person, and he cuts with love. And so I was like, you know what? If I gotta wake up at the crack of dawn to come wait in the cold for him to show up, I'm gonna which do you that, have man, because yeah, it's, which it's, we all have. It's a relationship. You know what I mean? It's like. Which is in there. So uh, that's how I met Pat. That's how we met and and met a bunch of like great, amazing people here. I mean, Pat is like the mayor of the city. Right. So he connects everybody. Um, And so, yeah, man, I was basically getting my hair cut here and and living a dream job. Like literally everything started to go right at Nike. Like I can't even lie. Like, you know, I did the MDP program. My last rotation. What's the the MDP? Marketing development program. So basically, again, like it started with CPG companies. Mm -hmm. You bring like high potential talent in. And you give them short stints of doing jobs so they get like a wide base yeah. of knowledge across the company, different departments, different geographies, different categories. So I did that for basically two years. But my last year of that, I had kind of an extended rotation working on the London Olympics. Mm. And it was always my dream to work in the Olympics. It's something I loved since I was a kid. When I was uh, in L.A. growing up, the, sure. you know, the Olympics came in 84. And it took over the whole city, and I was just enamored with it. The big billboards. Everything. You know, everything. Like, it was, that's when sport to me was larger than life, is during those Olympic times. And that's actually... And it was all marketing. And that's when I fell in love with Nike, because they were the ones who kind of supercharged that. And so, um, getting to work on the Olympics was like a dream of mine. And like, after a year working at Nike, I was on the Olympic team. Wow. Going to London back and forth, building, you know, this big presence for Nike and how we're going to like inspire the whole world around sport during this time and so um, it was just a really really great experience um, bro did you just hear what you said you said inspire the whole world yeah it's a very powerful statement from a uh, guy slanging juice I out know, of a van I know I know I know you that's know? what happens though that's what the Olympics mean that's and that's what, when man. Nike and the Olympics yeah. come together that's actually what happens and so yeah, yeah, you realize how yeah. much power you have yeah. as a marketer right and that's really kind of what drew me to the to that discipline in that industry is like it's one of the things that shapes the world 100 percent. what you see what you hear communications what comes from brands Nelson Mandela, like, man i mean i mean again we'll, yeah. we'll get there yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get, get there, get there. <laughs> um but um man yeah what a powerful journey i'm, yeah. I'm, gonna, pop, I'm gonna pump the brakes a little bit because mm-hmm. you are hitting them <laughs> right now <laughs> right you were hitting them and i just want to take a pause for a moment because you know, man, the, the, the thing that I when I met you, um, I got the privilege of meeting someone that I started looking up to instantaneously because at the Appreciate time, that. at the time, I was just starting doing T-shirts. I was just dabbling in my creativity. Mm-hmm. I was trying to figure it out, man. I'm like, how do you get a job at Nike, man? Da, da, da. Not knowing your story, right? right? right not right. knowing how to bring you value, right. not knowing the things that you're now teaching, right? And that I've cultivated later in life, right? Yep. Um, but I was so young and had the urge. And there are there, there are many people listening right now, 100%, that, you know, have that urge, that they want to connect, that they want to go higher up, that they want to do all these things, right? They want to go from the lemonade stand to the thing, right? Small business yeah, to like yeah. big corporate, whatever. Um, or have that cause-driven thing, you know? And, and they don't know... This is what it takes, everybody listening. This is what it takes. It's hard work, perseverance, sac- endless sacrifice, right? Like you put your wife and kid in Brooklyn while you were doing this thing and you were pursuing, you were chasing, but you knew this thing was going to happen. You even didn't take a job, right, to to potentially right. get the job that right. you wanted, no right? <laughs> There's still not a guarantee. There was no way to guarantee it, yeah. but you were still figuring out ways and building connections and building your your pipeline you're building your your vibrancy in your in your yeah. culture within yourself yeah, yeah. and still bringing forward ideas and creativity and working your ass off and that's 
for me, man, that is the, the representation of what it means to be resilient. Yeah. What it means to take your art, whatever it is, and then make sure it's embedded in those stories. Because no matter how far back you go, yeah. there's always resilience. And somehow art played a role. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. for your your art and music, art and, and pop culture and yeah. uh, sports. Right. Yeah. So that's that's the beauty of navigating not not from orange juice just to Nike, but just from a yeah, young man to a man now that is stern, has the belief, has the structure, has the a dynamic, right? Mm-hmm. Now, that those are all things that are valuable. Yep. Right? And that's what you want to bring to the table. Agreed. And so so now you go from 2010 to like 2020 and there's just like a a, a genre that you develop at Nike and they start you know, from from when we hang out and talk, you know, every time I get to see you, I get like a new story of where you went and what you did. <laughs> I had and I love run. that. I yeah. Had, had so run. tell us just, you know, the highlights of the, the, the remarkable things that you got to kind of have your hands in. Yeah. And, so, so, um, so after London, um, got a job in sportswear, leading that from a brand director standpoint, launched a, a great um, thing called Nike Tech Pack. Kind of changed the game on Nike Apparel. Bro, I remember Tech and, Pack. And are you like, kidding me? Yeah, man. I mean, I think like, I, I'll take a little bit of credit for all these cats that are able to wear sweatpants to work now, man, because the the, the product design and the marketing that we did behind that just kind of changed the game for men's athleisure. Yeah. So that was that was something I always will, will hold up as something that I, that I loved working on. Um, and then right, I did that for three years. Right around the time I started to get bored of that, I really wanted an international experience. So... I thought I was going to end up with a job in Amsterdam, EHQ, which sure. is where a lot of people go, you know, do my European thing. Yeah. And that was my plan. Um, and one day, man, my uh, uh, one of my, my mentors at Nike uh, talked to my boss. was like, hey, I want to talk to Les. And um, brought me in. He's like, hey, man, I have a job for you. I was like, cool. Well, where is it? He's like, it's in South Africa. I didn't even blink. I was like, yes. <laughs> yep. Tell me more. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready. Um, wow. And it was basically leading the marketing department for Nike Africa, which is like the entire continent, basically, um, and based in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I'd never been to South Africa, but it always been intriguing in the back of my mind, sure. like because their story is so young. You know what I mean? If I think about me being a child of hip hop and listening to hip hop in the 90s, mm-hmm. a lot of the subject mm-hmm. matter was about apartheid mm-hmm. and South Africa. So it was always like relevant to me. Our people. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of parallels there. So I, I love that part of it. And so I was, you know, as soon as he offered it, I was, you know, on board. Now I had to go through the, the process of saying, yeah, let me think about it and, you know, go visit and stuff like that. But I was already on board. Um, and luckily my wife was, was on board too. Uh, and we had two kids at the time. So pick up, move the whole family to Johannesburg. Again, I won't go too in deep to it, but yeah. it was a transformative experience. Loved it. Uh, that would have been June of 2015. Okay. Uh, landed there, immediately fell in love with the people, fell in love with the country. And like I always did, man, like I just started to really um, ingrain myself in the culture and immerse myself. I, I didn't want to be a tourist or an outsider. I wanted to, to understand exactly what it was all about. And so um, just opening yourself up you know, connecting with good people and being able to come out of your comfort zone and really like do things that maybe you wouldn't normally do and meet with people maybe you wouldn't normally meet with. And so that's kind of how I approached South Africa. I fell in love with it. My family fell in love with it. Um, the team that I, that worked for me out there became family. Um, and we did some amazing things in South Africa, man. Like back then we were in a geography called emerging markets, right? Which is like not really emerging markets. It was like Korea, Australia, um, you know, Southeast Asia, India, a bunch of different countries. And, like, Africa was definitely last on the list sure. in the totem pole. Like, people at Nike were like, you guys can do whatever you want. Like, yeah. we're not really tripping. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that until I was already there with the job. Right, right. But uh, we took advantage of that. We started to do some different things and take some risk. And we started to make some noise. And, like, we would start to get emails and calls from Portland. Like, what are you guys doing out there? Yeah. Um, Castor Semenya, who's an amazing athlete gold medalist, uh, middle distance runner uh, who has a lot of controversy around her. Um, we started to like really prop her up and tell her story in a, in a really interesting way. Now she's like a global athlete that Nike's telling stories around every sure. year. Um, wow. So we just, we really started to make some, some noise and um, you know, uh, the team really appreciated that. And it was like a great marriage between them sort of helping me grow as a leader 
sure. uh, and, and really how to lead a team. Mm-hmm. And, and I brought sort of like, you know, the 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 know how from from Nike and and and, and my experience and, and brought that to them. So it was like it was perfect. It was every everything I wanted that experience to be. It was for sure. Wow. Um, and then, as I said, my boss in Africa at the time, he took a job in Mexico City. Mm. And shortly after he left, he asked me to come uh, take a promotion to run the marketing team in Nike, Mexico, mm. um, which I didn't realize was a promotion. What it was, the revenue in Mexico was like twice that of the whole continent of Africa. Right. But again, it was another place. I didn't really speak the language. I had a decent vocabulary base, mm-hmm. but it was a completely different culture. You know, 20 million people in a city. Um, just a whole different vibe yeah. and like um, again the team there kind of embraced me but because I'd like was open to really you know not being a tourist and like trying to bring the American way of doing things sure. to, to Mexico City it was like I want to learn what it means like to be Mexican here and like let that be the thing that guides my moves and how yeah. I lead this team and so it was great I had a great run there um, wow. unfortunately my daughter didn't love it there yeah and so you know, I always put family above everything. Sure, and so sure. we kind of moved back to the U.S. Yeah. So uh, I ended up coming back to lead Nike ID, as it was called at the time, now yeah. Nike by You, which was the perfect spot for me, man. Sure. It was like direct-to-consumer marketing, 100% digital, customization. I finally got to work on sneakers because a lot of my time at Nike was either working on apparel or just cross category. Mm-hmm. So it was the first time I got to really just work on sneakers, yeah. and which is kind of the thing that brought me to Nike. Yeah. Um, and yeah, man, we had a, a great run. We, you know, we did the, the the change from Nike ID to Nike by you, a rebrand. We started to do some dope collaborations, just kind of really raise the level how people thought about it. Because yeah. for a while, Nike ID was kind of stale, and people were kind of like, ah, sure. it's, it's okay. They didn't think of it as premium. But we started to do collaborations with Cactus Plant, Flea Market, um, Hair and Preston, Pata. And then I was able to bring um, a collaborator from South Africa named Karabo Papi, who killed the Air Force One. LeBron still wears them to this day. Wow. So we really just kind of upped the ante for, for what customization is for Nike um, and raised the bar. And, like, wow. it, was, it was a great couple of years. And one of the last things I did uh, in that role was we started to dip our toe in what I'll call creator commerce. Mm-hmm. Is where we go to, like, local, I guess call them micro-influencers, just local people who have a following and get them to design their own shoes on mm. the Nike ID platform, the Nike Bayou platform, I should say, yeah. and sell it to their micro communities and they get part of the profit. Wow. So it's like they get to design their own Nike shoe and sell it and make money. Yeah. And it had to be the most fun, interesting thing I've ever that done. That sounds dope. Yeah, man. Like, not only was it rewarding for me because I get to connect with these like up and coming yeah. people and they get to like live out their dream and have their own Nike shoe. Yeah. But it was like super successful, like conversion yeah. rates, like the engagement yeah. was yeah. all like off the charts. Yeah. And we did it on a really small scale. We're talking two, three, four hundred pairs per person. Right. We would do like twenty five people in the city. Yeah. And I was like, this is the future. This is where it's at. Yeah. And I wanted to work on that full time. I was wow. like, I didn't really want to do, do anything, anything else. else. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of approached the subject. It's so of empowering Nike, though. And I was like, man, is this is there any way I could just do this full time? They're like Nah, bro, like, you got a job. <laughs> so uh, I kept doing my job sure. at a high level, but I started to research this idea of creator commerce and the companies that were working in that space. Um, and I found a couple. And, man, it just, you know, after being at 10 years at Nike, having an amazing run and really being kind of pulled and drawn to this creator commerce space that I saw as the future, um, man, I just took the leap and, and I left Nike and I went to work for a company that worked only in that space so wow i was like if i want to work only on that and i can't do that at nike i want to go do that i'm gonna find a place to do it and yeah. uh you know i made that leap shit a few months ago yeah like and uh that's and, when we reconnected recently yeah, yeah. So, and i started telling you about all of this exactly exactly and it was it was kind of i think we always find out we know, always man. find a way to connect at the right <laughs> times right where we're both like at these crossroads that are like inner connected dude 94 2000 2004 2010 yeah. and then now and then 2020 20, 2020 yeah like man. those were i mean pivotal yeah moments yeah, for you yeah. and times for you and same for me like yeah. that's not a coincidence no man and the fact that we know each other man i love that parallels yeah, yeah. it's powerful man yeah. it's so powerful bro i love i'm gonna point some things out for our listeners because I, again i want to always touch base on um on what it means to be resilient, right? Mm-hmm. But here we are, man. Like you went from singing, slinging this orange juice, 
Um, well, though, I, <laughs> right? You, you it was so, mixed. It was right. shaking. You know what I'm saying? Like pulp free. So, <laughs> you're doing his orange juice, you know. But you were learning. You're doing, and then you started hitting strides, man. Um, you know, when it came to Nike, when it came to the sacrifices, when it came to all these things, and what I see, like that thread. You know, and like you said, man, resilience, you and I definitely see that, you know, it's it's our part of our world. But I love how it seems like wherever you went, you found a way to elevate not only yourself, but the people around you, because mm. we all know that it there's no way you can do anything on your own. That's just not how it works. Oh, man. And you have to have a team. You got to have supportive people around you. You got to be adaptive. You got to be willing to grow and unlearn and relearn yourself and the things around you yeah marketing is a team sport man it's not like yeah 100 percent. it's not like i can go into a laboratory and come up with a you know a formula right no. like it's not science no right it's, it's art and science together yes. and it's a team sport like you just you can't do anything on your own yeah so um definitely a lot of like connecting with people you have to basically get people to work for you that don't work for you mm. which is a tough thing to do mm. right like People mm-hmm. that don't report to you, they you need their help, yeah. right? If you're talking media and art direction and copywriting, like not all those disciplines all the time fall under a brand director or a brand manager. And so um, you really have to have a skill of like rallying people around a cause or a thought or an idea or a concept and get them excited about putting their passion into that to get that over the line. I love that, man. And I love, you know, we, we I said the words earlier, Nelson Mandela, right? Yeah. I look up to him a lot and I've read about him a lot because he's just one of those leaders that I just, for some reason, just, I just vibe on yeah, that level. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think his powers were a lot similar to what your powers were in the sense of like, how do I bring a team together that can help me fulfill this idea, yeah. you know? And, and that's what it really takes, right? Cause it's sometimes it's not just convincing your boss. Yeah, it's yeah. not convincing your, you know, whatever. It's really like getting people to believe. Yeah. In what you're trying to do and yeah. i think that's that's from what i have understood and recognized about you it's been your ability to bring it, get people to believe in those concepts and ideas and what is potentially the future and how you kind of align yourself to get there or in the, in your organization I and it's that, man. yeah man it's very powerful and i love can we talk about this next work or, or is that we can still? we can okay okay we can. i will say that's probably the first and last time i'll be ever compared to nelson mandela so no. I, I appreciate that <laughs> i mean but, that but, i mean but, that respectfully no, you totally. know what i'm saying like you know we all do it in our own ways leadership is leadership totally and um look you know nelson mandela was so cool on like look <laughs> you don't need to be nelson mandela you could be you exactly in you right exactly. like however you bring you to your work is that it's leadership yeah it's, totally it, small I, scale big scale doesn't matter yeah totally what, so, what i'll say is that no respectfully just, no of course of course um after spending some time in south africa like i think what it is and we talked about it earlier is like there's certain communities of people whether that's a country or a race or whatever it is like they go through something and they develop that resilience by mm-hmm. getting on the other side so i think like what you think about nelson mandela is really like what i saw for all of like the people in South Africa, yes, right? It's like hundred percent. And, and really, you, you touched on this idea of leadership, and um, like um, I was I was talking to my boy about um, dog sledding because we were like you know considering going right. And so one of the things we were researching is that when they pick the lead dog for dog sledding, they pick the dogs that don't look back, mm. right? So that's how you become the lead dog. Mm. So the idea is like when you pass something, you know what's behind you. And so you consider that as you race, but you don't look back. Mm. And so I thought that was an interesting concept of like knowing your past, knowing what you've passed, like, but not turning your attention and focusing backwards. Right. So right. that was one of the interesting things I thought, like, That's in terms of leadership, a way to, like, keep a team moving forward, even with the knowledge of what's happened or what's transpired. Um, so sorry. that little No, no, was, dude, that that is a really beautiful and eloquent way you know, again, here it is. It's another gem for you guys, like, and and for me, to understand that just because you've gone through something, just because you passed through something, doesn't define you. You no. know, keep looking ahead, keep pushing ahead for what you believe should and needs to come. The changes we need to make, right? So that's beautiful, man. All right. So lastly, you know, we'll just briefly go into this. What 
what's your new experience like? What is this new job? What is this new sort of avenue that you've taken on? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, how can we support you? How can I be of service? And um, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll get to my last question when yeah, we get there. All absolutely. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. So uh, left Nike t- in September to join a company called Teespring mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. as the VP of marketing. Mm-hmm. And as I said, I really fell in love with this idea of creator commerce. I really think the idea of, you know, obviously a kid that grew up um, on sneakers and streetwear and wanting to work for Nike and that whole world has exploded commercially, mm-hmm. globally. Um, me seeing the next phase of that being the democratization of that and mm-hmm. really like kind of flipping the model and the, the power going back to the people who are actually driving and creating the culture and giving them the ownership, giving them the um, the revenue, giving them the seat at the table. And so um, that's just something that I think um, is the future. And like, I want to be a part of that, that, that change. And so uh, working for a company that empowers creators Mm-hmm. to own their own businesses from an apparel standpoint, mm-hmm. uh, you know, home goods, probably eventually footwear at some point. Right. Um, and, and being able to to lead the team that kind of creates the 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 brand uh, and, the, and the marketing around that to get people to really think about that as an opportunity for them is something that I'd like jumped at the opportunity for so um we're going through a rebrand now Mm -hmm. um the company's been around for a while but like we're definitely at an inflection point where we're really moving to focus solely on content creators Mm -hmm. and creators in general that they can own their own merchandise Mm -hmm. businesses from Mm t-shirts to hoodies to hats but all Mm -hmm. the way to you know home goods Mm -hmm. and digital products and Mm -hmm. um i'm just i'm really excited about the opportunity and like it's a whole different vibe than mm-hmm. than at Nike, sure. and it's sure. it's been empowering and energizing, and yeah, it's just it's the it's the next chapter in the next phase for me for sure. I love that man. I love that so much because you know my whole world has been that you know and, the, and on a very small scale, right? No, but it's it's but, all uh, relative. Yeah. yeah, man. Like you know, for like the last ten years, I ran and operated the printery, mm-hmm. and um, you know, so many people have been in and out of that world too. But As we, I told you, when I was yeah. going through the process of this job, I yeah. was always thinking about you. Because I'm like, I'm thinking about T-shirts. I'm thinking about creators. I'm thinking yeah. about people yeah. creating their businesses and, and getting their message out through merchandise. Yeah. So, like, I was thinking about you the whole time. Thank you, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, I'm, again, I'm so glad our stories are always overlapping yeah. in some way. And I hope to be of service for you, man, in the, in the years to come and, and see we work together in the future. Uh, but man, lastly, you know, I like to ask people this one question to kind of wrap things up. And it's basically, you know, the show is called um, the Art of Resilience. But my book is going to be called Art of Resilience, The Refugee State of Mind. Mm-hmm. My goal is really with the show and this podcast is to, you know, pluck out the state of mind of people who sit across from me and... To, to further develop and inspire mm-hmm. all of us mm-hmm. on this end, right? The receiving end. Mm-hmm. So with one word, how do you define your state of mind? Mm, that's a good one. That's a good one. It's got to be one word. Um, I love this moment, by the way. <laughs> the, the awkward silence is always we I love it. It's so good. Um, <laughs> Ambition. Ambition. Um, that word is, is probably one that I think I resonate with a lot. That resonates mm-hmm. with me a lot, I should mm-hmm. say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I know you can probably define it a bunch of different ways. But the way that I defined it is um, always wanting and striving to achieve more than is meant for me. Mm. That's how I looked at everything. Love that, like yeah. I thought was like, this is what's meant for me. This is what's laid out. This is what I'm supposed to be, this is what I'm supposed to have. And I want to go further than that. So that's kind of my definition, my personal definition of ambition. And that's what always drove me. So whenever I get to where that's probably what's meant for you, then I wanted to go take it a step further. So I would say ambition. Ambition. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Ambition State of Mind with Leslie Green. My man, my brother, thank you so, so much for coming on the show, man, and blessing us with gems on gems on gems (laughs) of knowledge. And I hope you listen very carefully. 
uh, to this man's wisdom, his remarkable story from his grandmother, to uh, chasing his dreams, to, you know, we, we didn't really touch on this, but um, I, I've had the pleasure of meeting your wife and she's a remarkable human being who I know stands by your side and is extremely supportive. Yeah. I've also had the privilege of meeting your kids <laughs> and uh, they're just amazing young people that I know help with that ambitious uh, personality yep. that you carry. And uh, I've again, I've just had the honor of knowing you for so long that I had to put the camera and the mic in front of you as one of the first people to interview because um, you brought so much to my life and enriched it in so many ways in, in pursuing my goals and my dreams that I hope now um, this, this talk and this conversation inspires the people listening um, that are also seeking their dreams and their ambition. So thank you again, brother. Thank you, I man. absolutely appreciate it. Much appreciate it. Yeah. Man, this was so good. Thank you, This man. was so good. Oh, man. You killed it, bro. Hey, wait. Just before you go, I have a little more to give. I want to give you a special discount code. But first, I hope you enjoyed our newest episode recorded live in our Art of Resilience mobile studio. I want to give a huge shout out to our main sponsors, the Center for Retail Leadership at Portland State University. Look them up at pdx.edu. Also, our friends at Portland Gear with portlandgear.com and Diaspora Coffee, an amazing company helping create jobs for refugees locally. I want to ask you, though, are you struggling to build a good habit overcome some self-doubt and fears, get focused on what you want to do, build a business, start writing that book and story, simply setting up some goals to achieve this year? Well, you need some habits. And in order to build habits, we need daily practice. You got to join the Resilience Club, which happens on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 7.30 a.m., where you are welcome to join for free and get into the best accountability club. Look, it's tough sometimes. And we don't have to feel alone in our journeys. We need some sort of push and someone to help guide us. Don't take my word for it. Look up the scientific facts behind accountability groups. You can join us easily as texting the word resilience to 503-461-1262. You can support us in two ways. One, by visiting refutees.com, poking around, and you may find a t-shirt or a poster that inspires you. You can use the code special 20 for 20% off. This helps keep our podcast going and gives back to the refugee community. Two, if you want to further sponsor our work and be involved with our Art of Resilience project, please get in touch through refutees.com. You can also share this episode and help us amplify our work to inspire and motivate. Thanks again for listening in. I hope to catch you next Wednesday for our newest episode, Trust Me. You don't want to miss this.